Hi, my name is Richard Shear, and this is the Montpelier City Forum, where we talk about Town Meeting Day. And we've talked about races for City Council contested in all three districts. We have the Mayor's candidate, Ann Watson. We have City Budget. We have School Budget. We have the bonding issues. And today, we have the City Clerk's Office, where we have our sole candidate, John <laughs> Odom, our incumbent. <laughs> well, thanks for having me. John, how long have you been City Clerk? Six years. So this will be, um, what is that, my, my third term, assuming there isn't a, a big write-in campaign. That well, assuming there is, anyway, <laughs> you're a lot well, better well-known than whoever would write in. Um, let's take us back six years ago. Mm -hmm. There was a contested race. Charlotte Hoyt, the former city clerk, had just retired. Mm -hmm. right. And uh, what caused you to want to be city clerk? How much did you know about the office at that time? <laughs> well, I had a pretty good sense of, of what the office did just from, you know, I was a justice of the peace for a while, um, so that, you know, they work obviously very closely with the, with the uh, clerk's office. Um, you know, I, I had sort of had a bit of an eye on it for a long time, and quite frankly, I'd been doing consulting for the year before, and the beginning part of that year, I had more work than I could do, by the time uh, the election came around, I was I was having a hard time putting it together, and I actually had a couple people come to me, and say you should do this, and I thought, yeah, all right, well that would work. It's a tricky thing to run for, right? Because also, well, you're not um, running against a long time incumbent. It's it's right, an empty office, but I mean it's a it's a tricky thing to to actually be prepared to win, because it is a full time job. Uh, and there's a lot is of moving pieces. Is it a full-time job or is it more than a full-time job? Well, it's, it's interesting. During the election years, it's a more than full-time job. Uh, on these off years where we just have town meeting, um, I actually have a little bit more time. And, that's where I've, that, and those are the years that I've worked on upgrading the system or some extra things for the city like the museum. But, but in terms of the trickiness of running, the problem is whoever wins, you have to be able to be prepared to start full-time the next day. And it's not a lot of people in a position to do that. I mean, what do you tell your employer? So, you know, I was down to 10 hours a week in consulting, mainly working for the bridge. So, <laughs> so you know, I was in a position. It was just a perfect, perfect timing for me to be in a position to run. Now, it's not quite the next day. I mean, it, figuratively speaking, it's not the next day, but it's close. No, it's literally the next day. Oh, is it literally day. the next day? Yep, the day after election oh, day. Oh, my goodness. I was clerk, Charlotte wasn't, and I walked to work. <laughs> but you already knew the people in there. Well, I was acquainted with... with uh, Crystal and her Yeah, I was group. acquainted with Crystal. Um, I didn't really know the other folks, though. And I, I mean, I, knew, I was acquainted with Charlotte, too. Um, but I'd already had a sense of Crystal. And one of the, you know, when I... When I and, Crystal was the deputy clerk at the time, the assistant clerk. Um, I mean, the first thing I did when I decided I was going to run was go in and, and you know speak to her, speak to Charlotte, and you know get the look lay of at the your land record just to see how <laughs> what the land records look right, like. Right, but also just to feel out, um, you know, how did they feel about me running? They hadn't had a lot of contact with me, and to the extent they had, it was, you know, really around election things, collecting lists, and. You know, I, I I didn't know what sense they had of me, and I I if you know if if they thought oh that guy you know I didn't want to <laughs> inflict myself upon them, but it was um, you know it was good it was very positive and and starting out was was great. I mean the folks are they know what they're doing. What's your role with city council? With city council, I'm the secretary. Uh, so you know I'm I'm there at meetings. I'm I'm taking minutes. I'm not formally the parliamentarian. They, the tradition is for them to uh, appoint one of their body as the parliamentarian, but I become the sort of de facto parliamentarian. And I also consider myself a resource for them uh, when meetings aren't going on, for information, for, uh, you know, sometimes for, you know, helping out with their concerns. So, and, and that can... You know, there's there's often somebody who's in touch with me about one thing or another, but usually it's just informational stuff. But you have to sit through those marathon sessions. <laughs> I do. <laughs> when there's a lot of discussion, you'll see me with two computers, and I'm working on other stuff during the day I need to get caught up on. <laughs> and it's it's kind of like if they don't hear from you, things are going well. Yeah, 
Yeah, and um, I, and when they do, yeah. it becomes the dog ordinance. <laughs> what happened with the dog ordinance? You know, I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> <laughs> the, the vote on the dog ordinance. Well, the vote it had been delayed for some time. The second reading, the first reading, had been pretty far back, uh, months back. So it became this process of continuing the second reading, just you know, in, in terms of keeping it correct under parliamentary procedure. And during that time, I mean, often between first and second reading, you'll see tweaks done, and, and some, you know, the, the council will approve little adaptations and corrections. And there was, um, although the, you know, the base ordinance stayed the same, there were definitely quite a few tweaks. There had been a citizen group working on it uh, to come up with a base idea, and then between that first reading and that and it delayed confused. second reading, right. there was, um, you know, there was a little bit more done. And uh, there was even there was even a push from some folks to to extend the second reading again this last time, but the the council was ready to vote. What and they took out the parks in the in the final it, that the parks would be separate separate. Yeah, yeah, they discussed. they distinguished the parks, you know, because the, in the sense that the parks have their own rules and yeah. Now before that, actually, I was referencing the dog vote. That had, oh oh the, because the special that was meeting one, exactly that right. was one where there was a problem. There was a problem, and I am very very conservative. Uh, well, I'm conservative in everything I do. I'm conservative with the land records. I just I I am I neurotically dot my eyes and cross my t's, and that conservative nature, you know, it, it, it got me in a little trouble. First, I, I made a very conservative choice and, you know, leaned on the council a little bit to follow that really worked in the favor of the, the folks who were opposed to the, um, uh, to the, the vote, you know. Which um, was to kind of deal with dogs in the park, right? Yes. And then the second decision I made when, unfortunately, the Times Argus screwed up the printing of the warning, which put us in a bad situation because I had a backup warning ready to go. We were going to fire it off because they were going to amend or even eliminate that item. And then the warning got printed prematurely. And I got a sort of a mixed reaction from talking to the city's attorneys. And it, it just wasn't firm. So then I had to advocate, you know, the conservative thing to do is just to go forward with this, which then made some of the folks who were very happy with me a couple of weeks before very angry with me. And so that's a, I mean, that's, that's a, a good illustration, I think, of some of the positions you might get put in in this role when you're, when you're really a guardian of the process. Now, you're a guardian of the election process, mm -hmm. and for, perhaps that's one of the most important roles of, of the city clerk. Oh, it's my favorite. But besides <laughs> collecting our water bills and our tax bills. Um, talk about that one for a second. How was that different six years ago than it is now? Other than the fact that you can get your petitions online. <laughs> well, yeah, you can get a lot of that information online. Uh, a lot of things have changed sort of top down in policy since then. Uh, probably the biggest thing is the same day uh, voter registration. Uh, that's When was that put in? That's a state law, isn't it? That's state law. Right. That was put into place a couple, maybe no, it was a couple years ago. Uh, that put me in an interesting situation because that's something I feel very strongly in favor of. And Why? Well, part of it is... There, is, will, there will be people who will say that it puts the system's integrity in jeopardy. Well, you know, I, I look at this as a balance, right? Um, there's a balance. You've got to maintain a balance when you're talking public policy between, you know, looking out for that voter fraud and essentially keeping the government out of the way of folks, um, you know, uh, performing their most fundamental right, you know, in, in, in an, any democratic society, and that's to vote. Uh, you know, I'm, that brings out the libertarian streak in me. I don't think government should, should be involved in that unless there's a problem. And there has not been a demonstrated problem with fraud at this point. So the scale, the balance was like this. Now, I, if you see that balance start to go this way and fraud starts to become a problem, you're going to see me just as vehemently go the other direction. But it's just not there yet. The balance isn't there, so I was, I was very much in favor of this. Now, have we seen any cases in the, in the last six years of people trying to vote for other people? Um, you mean as far as like voting twice yeah, or something uh, like that? Yeah, voting twice or, or 
saying, you know, that I, I'm, well, I suppose your neighbors are, are, are the ones who are checking you in, but has there been anyone who said, I'm, I'm Gabriel, I'm my son? Mm -hmm. Anecdotally, during the, the process of hearings before the, um, you know, before Senate and House government operations, you had a lot of clerks, and most clerks were opposed to this. Uh, you had a, a f small two or three or four sort of anecdotal ones. There was only one, I think, where there was actually a call to the Attorney General's office, and it was, you know, it was a, a, a definite issue. How do we deal with um, absentee ballots to assure the integrity of that system? Well, that's, that's largely helped by the other big change we have, which is the, so much of this process going online. In the last six years, we've got a new uh, common voter registration system, a common, you know, we're all feeding into a statewide database. So uh, the Secretary of State's office completely overhauled that system. It's, I mean, they took it from one that was Stone Age into something very modern. Um, and because of that, we're all able to track absentee ballots in a common system. So once someone gets tagged at that, they're not going to be able to go and, and vote somebody else. And with the same day registration, too, we can immediately tag them as having participated. So then if they try to go to another place and participate, that clerk's going to bring that up, going to look at them and say, oh, you've already voted. What's the last day I can vote absentee? and still have it count for town meeting day? Well, in Vermont, um, and this is different than other states, um, we expect that all ballots that are going to be counted have to be in by that common deadline, by 7 o'clock when polls close on election day. So you're sort of at the, um, you know, whereas other states, they're going to look at the postmark, they're going to keep that final tally open. Uh, in, in Vermont, we we just, we just look at that as a hard deadline. So you're somewhat at the mercy of the post office. So we advise people, you know, if, if they're going to get an absentee ballot and mail it in and you've got three or four business days, mailing days if, left. If you're going to have a friend deliver it by hand to the clerk's office, when, when does it need to be delivered by? 7 p.m. on election day. Oh, okay. When the polls close. Sealed and everything and yeah. signed. Everything that's in at that point gets counted. After that, it is not. How reliable are those machines that you feed the piece of paper in to get the little sticker? They're actually really, really reliable. This is, um, you know, this is different than like the touch screens and things that you hear about that have sometimes gone a little wrong. This is really reliable technology. It's this, you know, scanner technology that's been around for 25 years. It's it's tried and true and tested and. <laughs> those machines, <laughs> they're that really solid technology. I could just about throw one across the room and it would still work. But we do test them. I mean, there's a rotating, well, we test them all before we, before How we test them. Just throw a certain number of, of blank Yeah, ballots. we make a lot of fake ballots every imaginable way possible and um, put them through. And then there's also an auditing procedure that the Secretary of State does. Not to every polling place, but it's rotating. I think it's like, you know, Six ten a year, they'll they'll audit. I think actually, uh, Montpelier system is coming up for an audit here in the next couple. So you know they're they're keeping their eyes open. We saw in Virginia in the special election in Virginia that intent came into question as mm -hmm. to what is this paper ballot? What was the intent? You had intent come into question once in the Ashley Hill Francis Brooks state senate race. Yeah, what was that like? Can you walk us through? what it's like to try and figure out intent. Who is sitting in that room with you trying to figure out intent? Well, that was interesting. When during the recount, you know, which was, which was really overseen by the Secretary of State's office, you know, this, it was easier because it was within one party. Actually, it was very simple. So then it was just a matter of turning people out who identify you know, within that party to do the recount. Um, if it had been multiple party, then you've got to make sure you get folks of both. And the intent is actually generally fairly simple. I mean, even if people screw up their ballots and, and intent rules, we really do want to make it as... as now, can you, can you walk me through an intent or what it looked like? Can you paint a word picture of, of what one of those ballots that was under question in that race looked like? Well, there were a lot when we went from beginning to end where we would have to look where, you know, somebody fills in like 
one oval and then they cross it out and they put an arrow to the other one. You know, something like that is, is pretty easy to tell. Um, or somebody, you know, has a hard time with their hand and holding it still and there's a sort of scribble outside one. It's easy to tell. The, the last, I think it came down to three ballots in, the, in that primary that you're referring to. And, you know, looking at the ballots, I think I and most of the folks there felt like they made the right call. Um, there, was, there was a ballot that, I, th I think the oval wasn't quite fully filled in, so the argument could be made that it was, it was intended to be left blank, if I recall it correctly. But, but you know, I think objectively, I think, it, I think they, the, you know, it came down to a judge, uh, because there, were, there was you know, some finality, a handful, I think three ballots that needed to be reviewed. That, that the, the counters, the volunteer counters, couldn't come to a consensus on. So the judge made the Who were the decision. volunteer counters? Well, that's folks who came from the, the sort of democratic infrastructure. Um, because it was just the party. Because it was just primary. the party, which made it a whole lot simpler. Yeah, it was, uh, <laughs> that made it a lot easier. But it was still no fun. <laughs> now, you're cut into the national issues of voter, uh, voter fraud, I suppose, voter integrity, you know, no matter which way you look at it. What are they talking about on the national level? Is, is that a, a spirited discussion? And do you feel that the national system is secure for 2018? Well, the, I, I mean, of course, what we're talking about is, is tampering, electronic tampering, hacking, that kind of thing. Um, and that's a complicated question. I mean, our system is large, is, is very decentralized, although that became a lot less true with the passage of the Help America Vote Act after the what year was that? Uh, that would have passed in 2002. It was the sort of collective response to the Florida okay. debacle in the 2000 presidential election. That created some common standards, which went a long way to, to making the state's processes a little more uniform. It's still decentralized. So that's a, that's a plus for hacking. It means if you, you, know, you can't get in and right, mess right. them all up, but it's state by state. And um, for, for the most part, voting machines are not networked and not connected to the inter internet for the most part, which means the actual vote tallies at the polling place are, are going to be, you know, the integrity is going to be complete. The, so the big problem that you're folks talking about is that, that the voter registration rolls often are accessible from the internet. I mean, I think probably as a rule they're accessible through the internet. So that's where you could get the, that's the, the easiest target for tampering. How clean are, are Montpelier's roles in terms of having only people who you believe are going to actually oh. live where they live and, and actually vote? We just made a massive cleanup uh, last year. It was very satisfying. We get a lot of people coming in and out, a lot more than you'd think, that move in and out. And since the process is, is slow to take people off, um, our, our voting list tends to bloat very quickly with um, I mean, you had people registering to vote in, in Montpelier, I think, had never registered to vote before during the, when, when Bernie was on the ballot. And then they moved on to someplace else. But we have challenged a lot of voters. So in terms of active, unchallenged voters, it's at about 5,700 right now, which, which out feels good. Out of how many adults? Good. Uh, what percentage of our adult population do you believe is actually registered to vote? Oh, I think. Um, most of them, by far, because the other major change that's happened is that we now have, um, you know, when you go to the get your driver's license renewed or get a new driver's license, instead of opt in to voting, it's opt out. So you're automatically registered unless you specifically say don't register me, and nobody does that. So that's been great for making sure that that a much higher percentage of folks who should be registered are registered, and it's also been an extraordinary tool for us to clean up our data because a lot of our data is, is, you know, it tends to be out of date. People move and they don't, I mean, even across but town, if, they don't necessarily if you move let across, us know. If you move across town from District 2 to District 3 mm -hmm. and you vote in District 2, is your vote going to be valid? Will the vote be captured? Um, technically, we make people, we, we ask that people come and adjust their their registration so to reflect their correct district. Can which you we do can that? Do if I show there. up on election day and I realize, oh my God, 
you know, I think I'm on the roll still for District 2, and I live in District 3. Can you make that change on the fly? You can make that change on the fly, although legally, and I'm not a big fan of this, you can vote in the district that you're still registered in. I don't love that. But um, so that's why we try to encourage folks to get in the right districts. <laughs> Do you have any problems with the gerrymanders that create three districts in this town that are so unusual? That District 2 goes all the way from town from the edge of Town Hill Road down to Barry. Oh, and I, that District 3 includes some very unusual slenders and slices. And I, I don't think that's a fair characterization at all. I remember when they did that redistricting process, the trick was you have to have the same amount or roughly the same amount of people in each one. And if you look at it, I mean, you make it sound like it's New, you know, <laughs> North Carolina or something. It's a pretty even three, except there's this sort of thumb of District 3 that sort of pokes up there downtown. And I'm actually in that thumb. So that's the weird part. I think the rest is pretty straightforward, but that, um, that, that little exactly, <laughs> And that was just in there uh, to balance out, the, um, balance out the population. Now, most people know you for elections. Talk about our property taxes and our, um, what do you collect? <laughs> well, technically, it's not my responsibility to collect that anymore. It's in the finance department. It's just that it comes into my office, okay, what so comes I do. Into, what, to, what comes into your office for collection? I run on the, on the foul side of, um, of a parking ticket. Where do mm -hmm. I take it? You take it into my office. Um, this is one of these. It's interesting, since the finance, well, since the clerk and the treasurer sort of you know, split up into two different offices, the clerk's office is actually sort of a combination of staffers from both, but most of us, including myself, will will work on both ends of things uh, just to you know make sure the service works and people aren't waiting. So what in line. are you collecting? So we collect uh, parking tickets, we collect the utility bills, the water and sewer, uh, we collect property taxes. Uh, then more specifically to the clerks, we we collect uh, business licenses. Uh, you know, marriage license, dog license. Um, we we collect money for recording of land documents. Um, boy, I'm sure there's more, and I'm just not thinking of it. <laughs> marriage licenses. <laughs> yep, yep. Now, you've got a measure on the ballot in in one of in one of the articles. Uh, yeah, I guess it's it's sort of like mine. <laughs> I mean, I'm the one who put it out there and pushed for it. Would you um, explain that? Because most people have no idea what that's about. Yeah, and I'm going to get all that stuff on the website here and send out something so to try to clarify, because there's four charter changes on the ballot, and we seem to be changing the charter every, every year or two now. The one that, that I pushed for was it's a complaint I hear a lot is, is folks, you know, very, I don't mean small business people, I mean really small business people will come in and they'll get charged for the, um, you know, that personal, that business personal property right. tax for their, um, their, their business stuff. And a lot of them, you know, a perfect example, I think I was, you know, someone who, who was a masseuse and came in and, you know, she has to come in and, and pay this tax based on her massage table and a few things. And it's so small that it, it amounts to a nuisance tax. It's like the city isn't really getting anything from it. She has to remember to do it. And she, you know, she comes in and pays her $12. And you say all it is is sort of this pesky little thing. So I worked with the assessor's office, and the assessor's office felt the same way. And the, the charter change, because this stuff has to be changed from, through the charter, uh, because it's so, you know, it, it's, it, it, it's so defined. Well, it's so defined by statute. And the charter, of course, is its own statute. But this would, um, so any business that has up to you know, $10,000 of taxable uh, business property, business equipment, uh, would be exempt from having to pay any. So that, you know, that. How many remain left, uh, roughly? Um, it's actually. Other than national life. <laughs> <laughs> actually, with the, you know, putting the, at that level, if you, you know, this is really thumbnail, but if you've got, um, you know, about four to 5,000, technically, uh, about two thirds of them are cut right off. So it's just leaving that one third left. Uh, the hit on the uh, city budget is going to be about eleven, twelve thousand $12,000. Minimal. Uh, it's minimal. I mean, it matters. It really matters. I mean, when we're down into those budget discussions, you know, the department heads where we're literally clawing out $500 here and $500 there. 
But you know, there's also the expectation that even with with tax stabilization, we got some big businesses coming. What is in. tax stabilization? Oh, just um, you know, one of these one of these methods to to and there and there's several options under you know state constructions, and this is more of a municipal construction that that allows for biz, for tax incentives, you know, for for businesses that might come in. You can promise them that they're you know, personal business, personal property tax isn't going to go up for a few years. But I mean, the point is, we got some big ones coming in that theoretically this next year, when it takes effect, we'll will more up. than offset that eleven thousand. So we should be fine. So I see it as sort of a um, sort of a tax shift onto the folks that can afford it more, off of the folks that that may be struggling. Now, your office oversees land records mm -hmm. and property records. Six years ago. How has that process for the public changed accessing oh, land records and property records? It's very different now. Um, I changed the electronic vendor we were working on to one that was about a third the cost, maybe more, but also just allowed for much quicker, much easier access, which enabled us to to bring what was traditionally a, you know, roughly three month backlog of getting those things indexed. Um, to zero. I mean, that stuff gets put in every day. Uh, so it's, it's in instantly. The indexes are available online and all the, the actual you know, uh, images of the actual documents back through 93 are available online. And all the indexes of everything, including the book and page number for reference, are available back into the end of time, or beginning of time, rather. Now, that's from your house or from your office? Um, from house, office. If you come into our office, you know, that if you use the system remotely, then, you know, the vendor's going to charge a certain amount of extra money for that access. And if you come into our office, you don't have to pay that. But yeah, we don't have nearly as many folks coming into the office doing title searches as we used to because it's so easy now for them to access it remotely. So that's what's coming, great. What's coming up automation-wise in the next year or two in your mind? What, what are you headed to next? Well, it's interesting because the land records end of things, I feel like I've, I've, I've hit all my goals on that. So now I'm going to take stock and see where we can improve it and sort of try to keep with the times and, and also, also see if I can shave off a little. A Is there expense, any online payment um, that you haven't made, yet, that you haven't automated yet, that you're looking at? Well, uh, <laughs> I was all set to um, automate our, our requests for vital documents, for vital records, you know, birth certificates, marriage certificates, uh, things like that. But then a couple of months ago, the state announced that they were going to do it for us. Well, that's fine. <laughs> so I'm glad I didn't spend a lot of time and money on that yet. <laughs> so your office is looking forward to um, your um, USS Montpelier Museum. Oh, well, the USS Montpelier Museum is the one upstairs. What is your museum? My museum a museum is a total overstatement. So, you know, refer to it as the... The, as the clerk's collection, right? It's, that makes it, it that brings makes it, it a down. Very salacious. A sound. <laughs> but it's just, uh, I mean, the thing was, I realized we had some really amazing stuff in the vault that was largely gathering dust that people would love to see, but not enough to, to fill a room. I mean, we cleared out that, that um, digitizing everything, digitizing all our index cards. We really opened up that that research room that folks use, and you know we painted it, put in some new tables, we made it nice, um, and you know I thought, why don't we put some of that stuff on display? And that sort of sort of made me thinking, well, if I put that stuff on display, that's gonna it's great stuff, but it's gonna cover about half a wall. So I put out the word to folks in town, you know, let's bring in some more, you know, and I've had all kinds of amazing. Uh, you know, it's a little bit of an eclectic museum. Does anyone a, go there? People trickle in. I mean, every now and then we'll get somebody every few days who wants to come in and look at it. I actually have gotten... Does anyone look at the USS Montpelier Museum? That uh, happens a little more rarely. Um, but, you know, there's a... Uh, I guess, you know, that we have folks who, who show up to uh, march during uh, uh, the 4th of July. Uh, so, you know, that'll always bring a few more people in. So we get a handful of people a year. Who want to go up there, and that's a little different. That's that's a little more run like a private collection. The door is locked, so you have to come down and you have to get one of us to go up there and, and unlock it for you, and then we go up and lock it behind you. So it's um, but it's it's a it's. 
it's a really well maintained. It's a great collection, and it's. I wish more people knew about it. Now, I'm going to go to the secret task of the Montpelier City Clerk <laughs> is to maintain the Montpelier City flag. <laughs> Would you explain how we came about to have oh. a new Montpelier City flag? Oh, that's and, hilarious. And how the old one, you know, got into being. Yeah. Well, that's, again, one of those things that could only happen on an off election year where I had a little more time to breathe. But there, I can't remember. It's just a very well-known person. It was one of these TED Talks that you hear that I think they played on public radio and such where this uh, well-known, uh, I think he's sort of a, Jack of all trades, but he's a vexillologist, which is, you know, someone who studies flags. No, I don't know that. <laughs> now I do know that. Yeah, I didn't know either. <laughs> um, so One, one more time, that is a... a vexillologist. Okay, you know that now. <laughs> so there was a, this TED Talk about flags, about what makes a good flag, rules for a good flag, what, you know, the, the qualities of, of, of good flags and the ones that have lasted over the years. And then he talked about what makes a, a poor flag and his example was the Montpelier flag. So that hurt, right? Partly it was, it, it hurt, it stung, but it was also educational because as you heard folks on the council who were like, we have a flag. And we do, there was one flying outside, which wasn't really thought of as a flag. And it's because uh, many years back during a- Would you give us a word picture of what the worst flag being the Montpelier Vermont flag look like in the day? Well, it was a white flag with what was clearly a logo. It said City of Montpelier established, had a little background, and that's what it was. The, 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 the Rose Parade wanted to have representations from all the, the state capitals with their flags. Montpelier didn't have a flag, and, and there was like no time to work one out. So they took a logo that had been designed uh, for signs and just stuck it on a white background. What year would this have been, roughly? Oh, boy, it was in the 2000s. That's all I can tell oh, you. Oh, okay, fairly recent. Sure. Yeah, yeah, I think it was like 15 years ago, something okay. like that. But I'm, I'm pulling that out of thin air, so don't pay any attention to me. Um, so anyway, it, it, was, it was, you know, we were advised by local flag aficionados, or the city was advised, no, not we, I wasn't, um, that this does not make a good flag. And it was just sort of like, well, we got to have something. Now we have something. They put it on the pole and everybody forgot about it. Um, so once we were publicly shamed in that way, and you know, even speaking to the uh, person who designed the logo, she was like, I wasn't supposed to be a flag, right? Um, then we decided to, to have a contest. And that was- How many entries? We had about 60 entries. We, we, you know, we, we did it on the cheap. And the cheap and the quick it was all, you know, because I had said that I would, I would throw it together. I'm a, you know, I've done a lot of work on the web. Um, so I was like, I can slap something out there. What did the winner win? <laughs> the winner won our undying gratitude and some nice pictures of the flag with uh, his parents posing next to it. <laughs> now, could you describe our city flag? I, I know it's hanging outside. It is. Yeah. I mean, it's very reminiscent of the EU flag uh, because it's it's a dark blue background within the middle of a circle of gold stars. Now, I would say that that's our design from our original flag, you know, the, the U.S. up in the mm -hmm. corner, that blue background, the circle of stars. So they got it from us, so we're just bringing it back home, right? So it's, it's, and it's got 14 stars, which 14 is an interesting number in Vermont. There's 14 counties. Uh, we were the 14th state, so that 14 number comes up. And, you know, the description... I imagine there are 14 Illuminati, someone would say. <laughs> and, I mean, the description from the designer, you know, he said it, the circle, you know, is reminiscent of the dome. But, you know, I don't see that, but it was his idea. Let's go with it. And then underneath it is just a very simple um, sort of waving overlay of green to symbolize mountains. And it's very, very simple but it is very evocative of mountains. You look right at it and you know what it is. And that, I think, is really what sets it apart. And I think it's, it's really nice. We had three finalists and that was the overwhelming winner. Of, you know, we had about, what was it, about 300 votes, something like that. Okay, and one of them is in your office on the wall, on the clerk's office. Yes, we have a big banner of it for events. And I believe when we're flying. Yep. 
Is there a third anywhere, or is it just two in existence? Uh, one we're flying. There's another one inside because we had we had replaced the. There was also by the city manager's office. There had been one of the old flags flying, so we replaced it at that. So there's there's three right there, uh, but there's quite a bit more over um, the Montpelier flag works. Oh, right, right. That can so. be that can be ordered. I uh, I bought one. I have one that I fly in front of my house. Will <laughs> is there any discussion that that will be marched in the July third parade? That the city of Montpelier will march its flag? Boy, it should be, especially since we have that big banner. We ought to. We ought to. You know. Yeah, hope so. I hadn't really thought about that yet, but. Well, that's yeah. my citizen recommendation. Well, it was it was last Independence Day celebration that we unveiled the winner, so it would be only appropriate to to have it back out there. John, thank you so very much. I, I appreciate your time here, and I appreciate the fact that you're running again. It would be terrible if no one ran for city clerk. <laughs> it would. That's tricky. <laughs> and I want to thank everybody for watching this. But what's really important is that you watch the other shows where the races are contested because we have all of the candidates for city council. We have Ann Watson, our candidate for mayor. We have a discussion of the city budget. We have a discussion of the school budget. Of all of the other articles, besides John's article on personal property for businesses, mm -hmm. and get yourself knowledgeable. Nat at, and Michael at the bridge have an entire issue where they're devoting to the candidates, good issue. And Times Argus is covered. Please take your time to read this, but more importantly, get out on town meeting day and vote and have your friends vote and have your neighbors vote because that's the strength of our democracy is the participation, hopefully, of nearly 5,700 voters, which we won't have, but as many as we can have to help us make the right determinations and feel good with our determinations. And just to back that up, it's a pretty good metric uh, usually to get a sense of what turnout is going to be based on the early votes. Right now the early votes are very low. So folks need to come out because we're, we're looking at a, an embarrassingly low turnout and we can't have that happen. <laughs> Absolutely. So tell your neighbors we don't want an embarrassingly low turnout. We don't want to disappoint our city clerk John Odom. Thank you so very much for watching.